In winter time, the two faces of Fat Pig Farm begin to look very different from each other. But our kitchen and restaurant always feel alive with the energy of guests and long lunches. The garden and farm work have slipped into a sort of semi-hibernation, which means I have a little more time to indulge in some boutique crop ideas with people like agronomist Andrew Cook. What we're trying to do so a small patch, I can use this to grow a trial batch of wheat. Yes. So I want to, I want to flavour our bread. We churn our own butter and we take all our vegetables and fermenting them or serving them fresh. We've got our own meat, our own eggs. But I'd love to be able to make the bread and some of our baked stuff taste like the farm. Wheat is by far the most valuable crop grown in Australia. But while Western Australia and Victoria are the country's big gun producers... I'm a chef, I just want to go... Oh, <laughs> not many people know that Tasmania's climate, soils and abundance of water make our growing potential per hectare of farmland the highest in the country. So despite the fact that what I know about wheat farming wouldn't fill a bowl of cereal, I'm having a crack at growing my own. Can't be that hard, surely. It might sound weird, but I've actually been um, imagining planting wheat for years. It's one of those things, yeah, you eat flour from wheat every day, but I've always wondered how it grows, how it's harvested, how it's milled. Now we're going to find out, starting today. So how many tonnes am I going to get out of this? Tonne? No. <laughs> no tonnes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe 12 kilos per row. Yeah, 12, if we're lucky. If we're, if we're lucky. Exactly. Well, Which will be enough to make a bit of flour that'll make to it. make some bread. Yeah, that'll be brilliant. Exactly. My name is Matthew Evans. After years as a big city food critic, I bought a farm in Tasmania to better understand what I eat by growing it myself. I built a restaurant right at the top of the farm, but now I want to get a better understanding of what I eat eats. This means starting from the ground up to improve the health of our soil, our farm and our food for generations to come. From foodie to farmer to chef, to rehabilitator of the land? How hard can it be? While this may look like a run-of-the-mill, misty, tazzy morning, it may as well be Christmas, and I may as well be a kid again. Because I'm expecting something I've been wanting ever since we made Fat Pig Farm our home. Hey, mate. Okay, yeah, good, good. Yeah. Is it ready? Yes. A few weeks ago, I commissioned master blacksmith and genius sculptor Pete Matilla to make us an outdoor fire pit worthy of the Viking gods of old. And it doesn't look like he's let me down. Let's get it out of here and stand it up. You got it or you want me? Yep, no, this is all right. If you could grab that, that bar there. Joking. They are heavy. This is good. They'll hold heat really well. So yeah, let's just pull it out. Let's just go in exactly how we are right now. Sure. Excellent. Thanks, guys. So yeah, yeah. Oh, it's, got a, it's got a spin right around. It's exciting. It would be very nice to see a fire in this. <laughs> so I did make these to so they one in a certain way. Careful with that, yep. yep. Ooh, I think that's how, yeah, so they can move around. You can do this sort of thing too. Oh, yeah, yeah, right, right over the middle. Or you can swing it right out the way. I actually was like thinking like, you could have that as like almost like a prep station. Yeah, yeah, it's brilliant. It's like a little table. Yep. And that just sits just in there. And that, that just goes in here. Yep. Fantastic. I love it. I think it's time to get the fire started. Right. I'll go get some wood. Two hundred and fifty kilos of forged steel went into the making of this spectacular work of culinary art. The inspiration behind Pete's design was to create a stage for us to celebrate the passion that we put into growing and cooking our food. And I've got to say, I love it. I just grabbed a couple of things from the kitchen I thought might be nice to put on. I've got some uh, Tasmanian butter swedes. They're beautiful winter veg. And the Brussels, some pork fillet. It's 
it's really hard to know when you, you have a, a, a new grill or a new barbecue where the hot spots are. So I'm just starting at one corner and then I can work into the heat. This end over here has still got fresh wood on, so that's going to get really hot. So if I need to, I can go to the really hot or I can stay down in the cool bit or move things around as I need to. <laughs> Woo, that's still hot. Look at that. Beautiful. Oh, yo. Cool bananas. This truly is like that's... wanting a quad bike for your birthday, but getting a four wheel drive. And Sadie's pretty chuffed too. Do you want to join us? That looks amazing. Isn't this the best? That is just beautiful. You should try cooking on it. <laughs> <laughs> it's really cool. And what are all these for? You could you could hang camp ovens. Yeah. A series of camp ovens. You could actually put like a, a, a skewer or something, you have a spike through. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. This isn't lunch. This is actually just you heating it and seasoning it, seeing how it works. Yeah. Before we pay the invoice, just make sure that it does work. <laughs> and it does. I can tell you it really oh, does. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had round in my head. I had, you know, fire pit, round. Yeah. I'm like, we always knew we, that's what you wanted, a fire pit there. And that is nothing like I envisaged. It's nothing and like I, I envisaged. love it. I was, I was like, oh, is that how it looks? Oh, my God, it's so much better than I thought it could be. <laughs> Perfectly cooked. Thank that you very is. much. <laughs> it's yummy. Mm. Ooh, that's really good. <laughs> yeah, good barbecue. <laughs> ah. Sweet good, mm. isn't it? We had so much trouble to grow stuff. And you think, oh, that's as good as it can get. And then you put it on a fire pit. And it's better. And it's better. <laughs> These ancient cooking techniques. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. When I first escaped city life and bought a farm here in Tassie, I'm not ashamed to say that I didn't even know how to milk a cow. But with Fat Pig Farm's restaurant now built and busy, there's been a lot of on-the-job training. Because the fresh milk, cheeses and butter we produce are an integral part of our lunch menus. And it all comes from our two milking cows, so their welfare is really important to us, especially when there are new calves arriving. So Elsie just had a calf a couple of days ago. This little bloke there and... She gets this thing called milk fever, which means you can't take too much milk, otherwise she collapses and runs the risk of dying. But she's got so much pressure on her udder, I need to take some of that pressure off. So I'll take a little bit of milk over the next few days. This guy's eating his fill. He can only drink so much. Come on, come on, darling. Come on. Come on. Come on. See by the colour, still a lot of the colostrum in there, that really early milk. It's really creamy, it's full of antibodies, full of protein. That allows us to take some without affecting the calf. We always save a little bit of the first milking for in case we have a calf that's orphaned or that, that um, its mum rejects it. It's miracle stuff. Dairy cows need to give birth to be lactating so that we can harvest the milk that we drink. If they give birth to a female calf, that's another milker for a farmer's herd. But what many people in Australia may not understand is there is little demand for male calves like this little guy, because the cost of feeding them up for sale outweighs the public's desire for their low quality meat. So the majority are culled or processed as veal from about a week old. On Fat Pig Farm, we keep our dairy boys anywhere up to three years before they're bound for the table. But the facts of life on the land are, if you farm cattle, beef is probably a big part of your diet. And in winter, there's one dish that tops my family's request list every time. I want to make an Italian dish called ossobuco. Ossobuco translates really badly as bone hole, and you use the shin. Um, but it's cut across um, through the bone. Generally, this dish would always be made with uh, veal 
um, in Italy. Um, this is actually not veal, this is more like a two-year-old animal, so it's much bigger than you would get in Italy. It's a little bit harder, it takes longer to break down, but all these little lines and that bone marrow make the sauce really, really rich. So I'm gonna cook this in a casserole dish. The best thing is something you can go on the stove top and in the oven, because um, you need to fry things first. Ossobuco originated in Milan's Lombardy region around the middle of the 19th century. Base is hot. Whew. I like to start with a sofrito of chopped leeks, carrots and celery. Just frying those vegetables and try not to get colour on them, but fry them as opposed to just boiling them in the sauce. And then I'm going to fry the meat. And to make the ossobuco thick, I'm going to actually flour the meat before I fry it. So flouring the meat is essentially like making a white sauce, a bechamel or Mornay sauce. You're cooking the flour in butter. This is the exact same thing. It's just the flour happens to be sitting on the side of the meat when you cook it. I'm using our beef for this dish because I like to only cook with meat that we reared on Fat Pig Farm. But there is an argument that as a country, we should be eating more veal. The more veal we eat, the more valuable the young dairy boys would become to farmers and the better the calves' lives will be. When this is browned, add the white wine. Lots of people think red meat, you've got to cook it with red wine. No, this dish is awful with red wine. I've cooked lots of times. It's much better with white wine or you can do a mix, a little bit of red and mostly white. All right, so uh, this will deglaze the pan, which means take all those stuck bits off the bottom. Beautiful. My vegetables back in. And this stuff, this is tomato passata. It's essentially like a, a tin of diced tomatoes in quantity, but this is from our farm. Just need a couple of flavourings, so bay leaves and salt and pepper. So it gets finished with a gremolata, and I think that's actually the trick for the great ossobuco is, yeah, it's how you cook it, but it's how you finish it that really matters. Gremolata, I don't actually know what it means, but I know what it is. Lemon zest, lemon juice, parsley, and garlic. And that combination, it adds zing, it adds depth, it adds fragrance, everything, all in one little finale. What I'm after is the meat falling from the bone. Wow. And that's just popped, really easy. So put about half the gremolata in. And you want to cook that just a little bit. Two, three minutes, that's all. You could skim the fat off the top of the sauce, let it cool down and scrape it off, but you want that. That's where all the flavour is. And then just a little bit of this gremolata on top. Oh, yo. Butter. Mmm. That's delicious. Mmm. Nice with the bread. <laughs> Fat Pig Farm is far from a big dairy operation. Our two milking cows give us roughly 5,000 litres a year of fresh milk. But with one cow about to retire, I'm off to interview a new candidate for the position. I've just come to a, a mate's farm a little bit up the road from us. Pick up a new dairy cow. Florence is her name. I think I'll call her Auntie Flo. Our neighbour Georgie and her husband Fred have had this cow for six years. But between work in town and their kids' sport on the weekends, they've been struggling to find time to milk her. <laughs> Perfect cow collecting weather. Yeah, where is she? Uh, right at the top. Oh, that's her way up there? Yes. So we have to walk up and get her or will she come to the bucket? Oh, uh, she'll come if I call her. Oh, yeah? That's good. <laughs> nice to get <laughs> wow, she's thundering down. 
Yeah, look at her go. Is she fat? She's quite fat. Well, she, well she's pregnant though, but... Yeah, yeah, but more than that, she's fat. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> oh, that's good. Yeah. Okay. Do you want a taste of this? Come on. Come on. Come on. Come around. Come on. Can you come this way? <laughs> Lawrence, come on. You come with me. That's it. Good girl. Good girl. <laughs> By the looks of things, Florence seems like she'll be easy to work with. Come on. So now it's just a simple case of getting her comfy on my trailer. Come on, girl. I may have spoken too soon, though. Where's George? OK, clearly Florence is more of a business class girl than the back of a ute girl. Of course, there's always the time-honoured cattle class method of getting her to take a seat. Around you go. Come on. Up. kilos of not moving onto a trailer. Mm. Okay, with our departure time now delayed right. until further notice, I think I might leave the trailer here for a little while and see if she boards it herself. All right, I'll see you in a it's couple of hours. There. Yep. Yeah, I've got a couple of, hours, of, couple of things to do and I'll come back. After trying our best to get our new milking cow, Flo, boarded on my trailer, it's time to go back and see if she's ready for her long haul flight. Hello, Matthew. Hey, you got her in? We did, we did. I actually brought some carpet, an old bit of carpet out from the house, and put it in there, and in she went. Carpet? Over the back and up into the front. Um, and so she didn't sink into the mud as much at the front of the yeah, trailer. That, yeah. Gave her a bit of extra height and it was more secure for her feet to put... Yeah, she felt safer. She, she liked the up carpet? She went. Yeah, she really liked going up on the carpet. Who'd have saw it? Because our other milking cow, Elsie, has just had her calf, there's a potential for her to be aggressive to Florence. So I need to gradually introduce our new mother to the rest of the herd. You'll be able to see the other cattle up on the hill when she gets around the corner, but I won't take her up there now. I think I'll just leave her in here. Just let her get over the stress of the loading and the transport. Something for her to eat, something to drink. That's Florence, Carrie. For looking at, not for chasing. With Florence looking comfortable in her new surrounds and tucking into some afternoon tea, my farm work is done for the day. So I sweet-talked a good mate of mine into downing tools and joining me in a little speculative angling, the secret spot he's always talking about, about an hour south, near Southport. Might be a day for it. We're going to catch some squid. I'm here with Matt Tack, my mate, who's a pig farmer. Enough pork. Let's do the squid thing. Whoa. Matt suggested we use a float and jig to catch our squid. We can set it so the lure will hang in the water at just the right depth. So, Matthew, you want to set it for about six to eight feet deep, yeah? About your height, I suppose. And best of all, he reckons we won't get snagged. Just give it a cast out, sort of 10, 15. Now, while all my mates know that my fishing prowess is more comedic than capable, <laughs> Matt reckons that this is a surefire spot for some big squid action. When people see you come onto the jetty, they know there's plenty of fish for them. <laughs> I know, Sadie reckons the only time I frighten fish is uh, wearing my um, speedos. <laughs> yeah, what do you know about catching squid, Evan? All I know about catching squid is yeah. watch out for the ink. Because I was watching this woman catch a squid once. As she brought the squid in, she didn't let it blow the ink before she brought it up. <laughs> and it just kind of went like that and got her in the face. So. That, so I know That's more great. from watching than from doing. <laughs> Good, Matt. Ooh. 
Do you want me to get the net? Yeah, I think so, eh? I don't know how well I've hooked him here. I don't know. Maybe it's all right. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Patience, 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 patience. Wait, wait, wait. He'll come up. There we go. You can lift it straight up. Wow. It's a good size. Go. Nice, very nice. These southern reef squid are really common in this part of Tassie, and they can weigh as much as two kilos. So a single one this size is more than enough for Matt and his family for dinner. Look at that colour change. It's beautiful. beautiful. Do you know how to kill them humanely? No, I don't. OK, so you can just, you just pinch them behind the head here. Yep. Just pinch, and what you'll see is they'll change colour. See that? Oh. See that? Oh my God. So they just changed colour. He's gone white now. Yeah. That's it. He's done. With Matt's family dinner now taken care of, it's time for yours truly here to land something worthy of bragging rights with my kitchen team back at the restaurant who constantly rib me for being a dud fisherman. Pretty amazing to see that squid. Oh, the size of it, like, I was really surprised. I caught a, a couple of squid down here and off Bruni, but nothing as big as that. Whoa. What do you reckon, Matt? Mine's doing something. Yep. Oh, there you go. There we go. You're on. Gone. Oh, this is a monster. Nice. Wow. You were right, you can catch squid here. Yeah, I told you. Right. <laughs> this is like, I've never done fishing where you actually catch stuff. <laughs> Makes a refreshing change. Oh, it's it? good, isn't it? Yeah, it's really good. <laughs> so, and then squeezing. Find the nerve and pinch until yep. both sides change colour. There you go, yeah. the Vulcan neck yeah, pinch. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The ability of squids to change the pigment of their skin is controlled by their central nervous system. So, by severing the nerves to those little pigment sacs, they revert to their natural colour when they die. Thanks for that. No sweat. If I see on your Instagram account that you're down here catching squid without me, I'll be cross. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like I post anything on Instagram? <laughs> yeah, that's right. OK, with a bucket full of beautiful Tassie squid successfully hunted and gathered, I've got an idea on how to turn them into something that doubters back at Fat Pig Farm will remember the next time I go fishing. Okay, so that's, that's like it's skeleton. The thing with squid is, you either cook it very fast or very slow. Anything in between, and it eats like rubber. I'm going to do this one slowly, so it breaks down the squid's collagen, leaving it super tender. I'm going to cut this into pieces. I want sort of you know, triangular shaped pieces. I want, I want sort of chunky bits, not, not really rings. So, got the squid. Um, I've got this lovely garlic, just really fresh cloves. I'm just going to crush them. Um, then I've got this lovely sweet onion from the garden, chorizo. It's going to just melt into the sauce. Beautiful. Smoky paprika. Um, this is a Spanish one. Um, this is a posada. It's a nice tomato puree. Bay leaves. One of the things that I've discovered is a lot of cultures use bay leaves to balance the fishy aroma of seafood. A little bit of paper over the top and then foil to hold the, um, the steam in. So I reckon maybe an hour in a, in a low to moderate oven. Oh yeah, see you for dinner. Oh. Just finishing the dish with a bit of fresh parsley. Just lots of bread to mop up the juices. That lovely, sweet smell of the squid. Makes a nice change from char grilling it, which is what I tend to do. It's been 12 years since I moved to Tassie from the big smoke to open our restaurant. Taste the spoils. And in that time, I've come to realise that dishes like this are the perfect combination of our clean air, rich soils and unpolluted waters. Not too shabby. It's fantastic. That is absolutely delicious. Oh, you keep your job. <laughs> <laughs> Pure Tasmania on a plate. Fantastic. Oh, they're going to scatter when they get to the other end. Through the Here gate. Here we go. What a mess. 